and we're live. Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the Solvable Mysteries podcast. My name is Juras. As every week, I'm joined by Glenn Heikov, uh, and you know what we're here to do. We're here to talk about some more creepy cases. This week, we have a super baffling case. I will say, uh, before I hand it over to Glenn, this case is a complete mystery to me. It has been heavily suggested by a few commenters on our YouTube channel. By the way, for everyone who's listening to this, you could definitely jump to the YouTube channel, leave a comment, and, and we will add your case suggestion into the potential case file that we keep with all of your suggestions and we are doing the Springfield tree case it's a complete mystery dude your initial thoughts on the case and you know obviously how are you doing man yeah I'm doing okay um by the way uh we just hit a milestone this this very day on our YouTube account and then in parallel with that on our podcasts uh collectively we've I, our numbers have actually doubled, uh, I think, over the past two months, which is amazing. So, you know, thank you, everybody, for your comments and, and for subscribing and for the support. And speaking of support, uh, you know, suggestions like this are what helps keep our, our show going. So, yeah, this was something that people I, I mean, I, I would say one or two people specifically, but also other people, uh, fans of ours, uh, viewers, listeners had suggested this topic. And now I see why. I mean, it's. It's really mysterious. I, I, it's like one of those ones that I think I kept getting mixed up with other cases. There's like a lot of like the X three, you know what I mean? Fill in the blank three yeah. kind of cases out there. But this one is interesting because uh, two of the young ladies in this case are really like they were. They would have. I mean, if they were alive today, they would be only be a couple of years older than me. So they essentially they were in high school. They were graduating from high school when I was still in high school. If that makes sense. Yeah. Back in the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so okay, uh, I think this case is has a lot of interesting points. Um, we will try to address everything. I definitely know what I want to talk about here. Uh, certain specific details of the case. Uh, I'm not sure if we will be focusing on absolutely everything in this case, but I definitely want to hash out certain insanely creepy details. This is some horror movie stuff. Strapping, guys. Um, the quick introduction to the case, right, uh, would be this. Uh, basically, the Springfield Tree case refers to an unsolved missing persons case that began on June 7th, 1992 in a town called Springfield, which is in the state of Missouri. Uh, it basically involves friends, Suzanne Streeter and Stacy McCall, and then Suzanne's mother, Cheryl Levitt, because they all went missing under really creepy and completely unexplainable, at this point, at least in my opinion, circumstances in Missouri, uh, in the city of Springfield. Um, now, I guess... We have a detailed timeline here. Glenn really came through in the last seconds. He really, uh, you know, uh, provided a really nice timeline. Like, uh, he found some good research on this. Uh, so I want to go through the timeline. But just to set the stage right, a quick back and forth with Glenn would be, this is all happening in June. So this is graduation time for many college, I mean, for many well, obviously college as well, most likely, but also uh, school students, because Suzanne and Stacy, they were graduating school, right? So um, before we jump into it, uh, I don't know, man, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, because you literally graduated at like certain, not the same year, but like around the same time. So it was graduation a big thing? Because for these women, uh, graduation seemed like a big event. They had like parties like multiple parties on this the evening uh of their disappearance i would say uh they had planned water park trips for the following day initially for the same day but then plans changed we will get into that but yeah dude my question is was graduation back in like the early mid 90s uh in america is this like a big event where it's like everyone's like trying to celebrate have a good time right yeah definitely i mean you know, it's for some people, it's kind of the biggest event of their lives if they don't go to college. Um, I remember my high school and other high schools in the L.A. area had something similar to what 
what is gonna gonna happen here where there's like a theme park that like in, in the case of my high school there's like a special trip to disneyland i think at like midnight or something and it's only open at that point to high school graduates from these schools that have signed up for it you know what i mean so they close disneyland for everybody else um graduation night and then they have like all these kids from all over la show up now i'll say for me it was a big event you know i had like relatives like family and stuff there i had kind of a weird senior year though like i had sort of like uh i don't know i wasn't entirely into i I graduated got everything done but like i had just broken up with my my then girlfriend a couple months before that and i i didn't go to prom i didn't do any of the senior events so for me it was a little bit different but no for everybody else yeah this is like a major event you have all these different things going on and actually some of the stuff that they mentioned um sounded very familiar so yeah they, they did definitely a very 1990s you know all in everybody's really happy but also kind of sad to be leaving their friends kind of graduation all right all right um okay so before we jump to the exact timeline and the particular interesting timestamps, stamps want to quickly go over the victims starting out with um suzanne's mother Cheryl Levitt. Uh, she was 47 years of age at the time of her disappearance. She was a single mother to Bart and Susie Streeter. Bart wasn't living with them anymore for um, reasons we will we might discuss later. There was some family drama. Uh, now, Levitt was uh, twice unhappily divorced. She moved to Seattle for a new start in 1980. She and Suzanne were very close, it says here. But the relationship with her son, Bart, was volatile. Bart had, like, substance abuse issues uh, regarding alcohol. Levitt was a hairdresser with approximately 250 customers and good reviews. Uh, she, uh, Some people state that she was a cosmetologist, I think. Uh, I don't know. But uh, she was definitely a hairdresser as well. I'm not really sure about, like, the positions at uh, these locations. Uh, anyways, she enjoyed fixing up homes, it says here, which is kind of interesting. And her last phone call centered on repainting some furniture. She had finally saved enough money to buy the small but pleasant home and was enjoying the opportunity to decorate. Now, this home that we are referring to, we have it on the Google Earth map. We will be jumping to it probably a lot during the show. And, uh, you know, because that's the place where everyone disappeared from. So we'll be looking at this home um, quite heavily, I think. Um, and, you know, on the day of her disappearance, she went home uh, after, you know, the graduation ceremonies. Uh, and then later on the day, she had a phone call at, at around 11.15 p.m. in the evening. That's the last time she was accounted for. Uh, now let's move to Suzanne, her uh, daughter. Uh, she was 19. She just graduated. She worked at a local theater. Um, yeah, but I think uh, she was definitely not working on 6th and 7th of July. July of June, I'm sorry, because of graduation activities. She was outgoing, interested in becoming a hairdresser just like her mother. Okay, uh, then we have uh, the last uh, person, which would be Stacy McCall, who was the friend and classmate of Susie, I believe. And Stacy was the daughter of Janice McCall and Stu McCall. Uh, Stacy was, uh, you know, it says here she was a lovely young woman. She worked at a local gym and modeled wedding dresses. There are some pictures of her in, like, in a wedding dress. And she intended to join Southwest Missouri State University in the fall. Uh, so yeah, that, that's pretty much uh, all we have. We also have that uh, Stacy and Susie were close friends, uh, planning for their new lives and the adventures meant uh, to await them. Uh, Cheryl too was enjoying her new financial and personal uh, improvements finally back on her feet since moving to Springfield. So uh, things were looking up until the night of June 7th when everything gone to uh, S, pretty much. Now, let's jump to the timeline on June 6th. I will be j stopping throughout the timeline and like going back and forth with Glenn on certain timestamps. Uh, they, they will be interesting, at least some of them. So let's begin with like 4 p.m. 4 p.m. on June 6th. 
uh, you know, just a little bit uh, later in the afternoon, um, Cheryl is last seen at graduation ceremonies. She planned to return home to work on the house and some refurbishing. I think she was painting some some uh, piece of furniture. We'll get into that into that most likely later on. Now she is last time that she was uh, accounted for was 11 15 p.m she spoke to a friend on the phone uh, and i think she told the friend that i'm just painting that piece of furniture uh so yeah literally that's all we have on cheryl uh, i want to jump to stacy and susie but before i do that dude do you have anything more on like cheryl because we only have like these two time time stamps you know no that's all I'd, i've heard about her either uh from my side yeah Right, so let's let's jump to Stacy and Susie. Um, so initially, their plan was uh, to be to head to Branson, Missouri, on the same night, on the gr graduation night, June sixth, after the parties. However, they arranged to stay overnight at Kirby's. Uh, if things ran too late. Now, who is Kirby? I kind of rushed past Kirby. So this is Janelle Kirby, a friend of Stacy and Susie's who Stacy and Susie had planned to go to the water park, you know? So this is who Janelle Kirby is. Um, now, let's jump real quickly to the Google uh, Earth map. Uh, this is uh, 1717 E. Delmar Street. This is uh, the house in question where the woman disappeared from. And this is Battlefield. This is the town of Battlefield. This is where, uh, for a good period of time, the two women spent partying. Let's go through the timeline a little bit here. Uh, so 6 p.m., gradu graduation ceremonies end. Uh, both girls go home to change and pack separately. Uh, so, you know, Suzanne goes to her home. Stacy goes to her home after graduation. They pack, they hang out with the family, uh, but they meet up at around uh, 8 15 p.m to 8 20 p.m uh to go to parties in battlefield you know so two hours after the graduation they do their thing now they're back partying because that's what you do on the celebration on the you know uh i guess uh graduation day now at 8 30 p.m they attend a party at brian joy's home they arrange to stay at his house as night falls however he eventually cans his offer so apparently he's like yo guys you could stay at my place uh tonight but then he's like uh guys i don't think you can stay at my place tonight is that like what had happened there because i'm because before even looking at this particular timeline i haven't i have not even heard about this brian joy person you know yeah i thought i heard a version where they were gonna go hang out at one house and then they like, like like even even before the other switch that happens mm. later later that night where they they were they were gonna go hang at one house and then maybe they decided for whatever reason it wasn't gonna be their kind of party. I'll also say it is possible. Maybe maybe the subtext is because this this happens right. Maybe parents sometimes get a little bit uptight about partying or about you know the opposite sex being there, the opposite gender. And they're like, well, you know, so maybe he had to, like, <laughs> take back the invite yeah. because of something like that. Like, maybe his mom or his dad was like, eh, you know what, just because you had to graduate doesn't mean we got to break the house rules. Yeah, and, and these are all kids, essentially. You know, they're, like, they're growing up, but, like, they're still, like, 18, 19. These are all, I mean, I'm pretty sure, just really quickly, dude, in, in Missouri, back in 92... At 18 or 19, I don't think you're allowed to drink alcohol. Am I not mistaken? Mm, you're right. Yeah, no. I think I think you have to go back to like the 70s or something, or to to find an era where people were, you know, like you said, kids basically under 21 could drink legally. So yeah, no, it's definitely illegal. Yeah, because uh, another thing is these parties are happening, and the two girls, Suzanne and Stacy, they're driving their own separate vehicles around you know, Springfield, Missouri area. So they're partying, but they're driving around. So really quickly, another question. I didn't run into a situation where they were actually drinking any alcohol. So they're like just partying as in hanging out. I don't know, having like some juice or whatever, right? 
Yeah, well, that, so that's a, this is a good point to bring up. This came up in some of the research was that for the second party, um, there was, I, th I think it's the Kirby party. There was actually like like a pledge. It was, you know, one of those things where they said there wasn't going to be any drinking for sure. So it was like a group of kids that were going to like lock themselves up in the house, like all stay in one place and they weren't going to drink. So maybe that was the condition with the parents, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, okay, you know, you can have a social thing with, like, absolutely no drinking. I don't want any problems. So now when we get a little bit later, I'm going to refer back to this because I had a, my own little pet theory about maybe how how they didn't end up staying at this party or just mm. little suspicions. Yeah, you know, yeah. Anyway, like I said, you, you, you already alluded a little bit to it when you mentioned the substance, substance abuse problems. Uh in the um uh, the, the Levitt household um, Barth. yeah but it, it turned out it wasn't just him and i'll i'll, I'll elaborate on that but yeah anyway All right. I'll, I'll tuck that away for later okay perfect uh okay so uh now 10 30 so okay so uh before uh, just to remind the audience members 8 30 p.m they come to brian joy's home uh we all we just know that he later on tells them you can't stay here so 10 30 p.m two hours later stacy mccall calls her mother janice mccall to say they're staying at janelle's kirby's overnight so i'm assuming from 8 30 p.m to 10 30 p.m they already switched from brian joyce to janelle's kirby's she promised as in stacy promising to her mother janice to phone the next morning before they leave I guess for the water park or whatever. Now, between 11.30 p.m. and 1 a.m., so that's a time frame of 1 hour and 30 minutes, they relocate to a second party in Springfield, Missouri. So this is their third relocation at this point, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but accounts are actually conflicting as of the time. So it's really choppy here. We can't really see for sure. But the next thing we know is one 50 a.m to 2 a.m so this is already june 7th this is the next day but like really early morning hours or like the middle of the night you could say they return to joyce and walk to kirby's which was i don't know what this means but this means that they probably were at some other party they go back to joyce uh, brian joyce home maybe they leave their cars there but they walk to kirby janelle kirby's home because maybe janelle kirby's uh, residence was really close to brian joyce residence maybe that's what's happening there now 2 a.m to 2 15 a.m at janelle kirby's home they quickly realize that the house is full and there's like some people staying like some uh, extended family members staying at janelle kirby's home and they're like yo we're not sleeping on the floor here and then later on janelle kirby uh, after you know uh, the the woman went missing she felt really bad that she didn't you know kind of insisted more uh, for the girls to stay because this is literally the time when they decide nope i'm not sleeping we're not sleeping on the floor we're going back to suzanne's house you remember cheryl levitt the one who was supposed to work on some furniture well they were going back to her house uh to to i guess spend the night now uh we have at 2 15 a.m stacy and suzanne leave janelle kirby's home in separate vehicles and head to uh, to Cheryl Levitt's home back in Springfield. So let's immediately jump to here. And I think I want to immediately jump to the Google Street uh, view for this particular, uh, I guess, portion of the podcast, just so the audience members who are actually on YouTube for this one can actually look at the house because this is the exact house where they go missing and crazy stuff starts happening. Um, so we have them arriving at this house somewhere between 2.30 a.m. and 3 a.m. Stacy and Susie arrive at, you know, Cheryl Levitt's home. Their cars are parked in the driveway because we see it's a interesting little driveway. There's like a circular like shaped driveway a little bit but then there's also like a uh, 
not, I wouldn't say a garage, but like a thing. I don't know, maybe Glenn will articulate later on what you could describe this to the people who are listening uh, to this on the podcast apps. Uh, to finish off, um, their purses and valuables were neatly placed inside of the house. And Stacy, so Stacy is not a resident of this house. Stacy is a friend of Suzanne, who is the resident of this house. Let's just keep that in mind. So Stacy's clothes were folded on the floor by the bed as if she, you know, tightly folded her things, uh, left everything, parked her car there and went to bed. However, they didn't go to bed. They literally vanished before we jump into that, dude. Uh, anything you want to add because I'm pretty much done with like the events leading up to the disappearance yeah so uh, just to answer your question that's called a carport so it's you could, a carport is best described as a as a um, like a, an, a a garage with with a roof and no walls which is pretty close to what that is you know the only thing is yeah. really just the, the only walls are basically the house right yeah next to it yeah so, yeah, and it is, I mean, it's funny you, you mentioned the driveway. I also thought the driveway was kind of cute. It almost looks like, I, I think it goes through on both sides, right? Is that right? It's almost like a double driveway? Yeah. Yep. Which is kind of neat. It's like, you know, if you know what I like about that is just having done a lot of family get-togethers and stuff. We have, I have a family member who has a, a really nice driveway like that, but it's like up and down, if it makes sense. Like mm -hmm. it goes up to the house and then it goes out the side. And it's awesome because you can fit like, I don't know, six, eight cars in there sometimes, you know, depending how everybody parks. So wow. when you're having like, a, yeah, you're having Thanksgiving, it's like perfect. Nobody even has to park in the street. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, it, it's the whole setup. It's like on one hand, you have people just doing like having some of the happiest days of their lives. And then you have all of this wandering around. Now, one of the things that I was alluding to earlier Maybe this is a good time for it. Yeah. Is I kind of wonder. So, yeah, on one hand, you know, they do point out like the Kirby household had a bunch of people that had come in, you know, from out of town, extended family, probably grandma and grandpa and stuff like that to come see the graduation. So that's like a little weird to be trying to party around them, right? It's like a packed house. Like, oh, so you're, you know, <laughs> you're, what's your name's grandma? Huh? How are you doing? Like, I don't know. It's, it's a little Janelle, weird. Janelle Kirby's, yeah. Janelle Kirby's grandma, oh, you know, like, like, <laughs> want to do shot. I mean, they're not drinking, but then I guess the other thing I kind of wondered was because there's, there's some, in some of the, the, the research, I guess there was like, like, uh, what's her name? Um, I'm always so bad with the names of these things. <laughs> it recently, I, I said, yeah. It's so hard, I know, like, like, I need to have them in front of me. Yeah. So, um, who who Street are you? Or, uh, sorry, sorry, Stacey, Stacey McCall. Yeah, yeah. Stacey McCall had actually called her parents and like let her, you know, they, they, she kept them in the loop. So, I mean, it wasn't like she was being deceptive about any of this. And that's, you know, full disclosure. She had been like, okay, like, you know, we're going here, we're going there. And then I think her parents were actually kind of relieved because they trusted um, uh, Mrs. Levitt. Or Ms. Levitt, I guess at this point. Cheryl. Cheryl Levitt, yeah. That, that you know, to have you know, it's a good friend or whatever, a pretty good friend. So okay, she's gonna stay at her house. But here's the thing, like, so her son, who's you know, not missing and alive and been looking for everybody, he mentioned that the family, it wasn't just him with the, the substance abuse issues. It was like the mom, the boyfriends, the people she'd been intimately involved with. It was like a family with a history of alcohol issues. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can't help, but wonder if there was any kind of like, well, you could just go back and have a couple drinks at our house and no, no, no. And, you know, I think I, I could see some people getting mad at me for saying that, but you know, it's not unheard of. I've, I've definitely seen that situation before. So I don't know. It is a little bit weird that they didn't stick with like the kind of sane and sober party plan I get. Because they, they were supposed to go to a, a well, like, like a water park, I think, the next day. Is that correct? Yeah. They were supposed to drive down. Um, like, to... <clears throat> well, uh, just uh, a quick, uh, you know, for people who have never heard about the story. So regarding the water park, I think the water park wasn't the, the main event of that trip. Uh, they initially planned on June 6th, graduation night, to go to the town, which is out of town, not in Springfield. Uh, that has the water park rent out a hotel room 
party there and then go to the water park so i think it's like more of a let's be independent let's go to this other town let's rent out a hotel let's chill out and then oh there's a water park let's let's go for the water park so it, i think the main the main uh point of interest for that trip was like being independent being in the hotel room uh partying so that, that just to, to pause on that that's interesting because somebody Somebody that goes with them would have to be like, I think 25 or over because a lot of hotel, you know, hotels, obviously they know what kind of nonsense young people get up to. Right. So at least in a lot of places in this country, you can't rent a car or get a hotel room under like certain ages. I think it, maybe it's like 21 for a hotel room for, for rent a car. Often it's more like 25. Like I know when I went, when I went to Hawaii with my parents and my wife, like I wasn't supposed to be driving the car. I did, but I, it was like they only wanted you to be 25 or older, which is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know what I mean? So it, it, it just just a little logistics. It is kind of interesting to think some some older adult must have been like designated to go with them. I don't think so. I, I don't think huh. so. I think it's like just like them. Uh, maybe it was some yeah. hotel that would take them, if you know what I mean. Uh, perhaps because yeah. I, I didn't run into anyone older. Um, yeah, dude, uh, I feel like uh, in respect to Bart Levitt, I just really want to, because I don't think uh, we've, I, I kind of want to also add uh, the thing that there is a blog dedicated to this case called the Streeter Family Blog. And now I kind of want to diverge any possible um, suspicions. At least maybe you have some, but I cl absolutely don't have any. Uh, towards Bart, uh, Bart Levitt, because he's the one running the website, so he's like actively trying to figure out who killed. Uh, oh, oh my God! I just messed up. Who not? Who who potentially abducted the three women, which included his mother and his um, sister? Now, why I say that is he did have substance abuse abuse issues i think don't quote me on this he had punched uh suzanne at some point i have no idea but i just want to finish my thought yeah is that he cleaned up from everything that i gathered he cleaned up and he is really 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 sorry and he is super uh sad that his connection with his uh, family ended in a bad way where when they disappeared they were at bad terms because he cleaned up he became a good person and um yeah just just on my end i didn't find any suspicion of why i'm saying this is because in the notes that we have we sort of have him as a suspect i just want to quickly say that i personally don't have him as a suspect that's all i'm trying to say here no no i'm i'm, I'm right there with you yeah that's i mean it, so it turns out like whenever anything like what we're about to describe happens, they for sure look at everybody who's like ever lived in the house or, you know, close relatives and especially male relatives because, you know, like <laughs> men are statistically more likely to do violence. And, um, you know, it's just, just, just there's, there was some, like you said, some, some bad blood. Um, from what I understand, he didn't assault anybody. It doesn't sound like it sounds like things were thrown in the house. So I'll just I'm, I'm actually going to take his side a little bit, uh, even though that might be a little weird. So what happened was he had kind of like split from the house when he had 18. And I don't know that he that he had such a great childhood with his mom. I mean, his mom maybe was drinking a little hard and having kind of weird husbands and boyfriends and maybe not being like a super great role model at that point. And, you know, I don't think a drunk parent is so fun to be around. Um, a lot of alcohol in the house. So, like I said, they, he, you know, so, sometimes, by the way, sometimes sometimes the older child in a family kind of goes through the toughest times. And then the younger child gets the parent kind of in a, in a better state, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? So, you know, the parents had a chance to kind of mature and maybe get over some of their substance abuse problems. Um, they're not cigarettes, apparently, according to this thing. Uh, anyways, yeah, so what happened is at some point he comes back to kind of comes back into their lives and he, he says, oh, you know, to the, to the sister, well, let's get a house together. And then it's like a Saturday night and he's like, I guess she came home and he was like, 
I know, listening to music loud. And she's like, well, turn down that music. And he's like, it's Saturday night. Like, I'm, I'm partying right now. Like, I'm not going to turn it down. And then I don't know. I don't have any specifics about who threw what. They just said said that objects were thrown. So it's put in a really, really vague way. So it could be that he doesn't want to throw his sister under the bus now that she's gone. You know, apparently, yeah, yeah. maybe forever. So, yeah, but yeah, to your point, he has done nothing but, like, he's been, he's been 100% cooperative with the authorities. He passed a polygraph for whatever that's worth. Dr. Grande says it's not worth anything, but for whatever reason, he was willing to take it. Mm. And uh, like you said, he ran the blog, and I think he actually handed off the blog to one of his children. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yes. Uh, he recently has. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, now, let's jump into what happened in the early morning hours. Um, so I want to bring in another dude called Nigel Holderberry. Holder, Holderby, I'm sorry. Nigel Holderby. So Janelle Kirby and Nigel Holderby were kind of friends of both Suzanne and Stacy. And I guess during the previous night, during the whole bunch of like switching, partying, driving to different places, uh, they kind of all hashed it out between themselves. The next morning, let's go to the water park. Uh, now, I don't know how communication worked back in the day. Uh, phone, cell phones were not readily available, if, if at all. This is 92, most likely none, to be honest. So, uh, Nigel and uh, Janelle Kirby, they don't hear from the two girls. Because, like, yo, when are we going to go to this water park? So, somewhere in between... Uh, oh no, so they try to contact. This is this is uh, an interesting point. From 7.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. of the following day, Kirby and Nigel call separately to see if Stacy and Susie are ready to head to Branson. They get no response really quickly. So this is them calling from home phones to home phones, right? Yeah, it would have had to be. Oh, yeah, because yeah. nobody, nobody had, nobody that age had pagers or, or cell phones or anything. It was, it was inordinately expensive. All right. So, so it was a, f yeah. a house to house. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's that makes sense. Now they don't hear anything. Now let's jump to uh, eight a.m. Kirby, Janelle Kirby's boyfriend Mike Henson decide. So basically, Janelle and the boyfriend her boyfriend who is Mike they both decide somewhere in between 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. to stop by the house to check on the girls and they arrive to this exact house that we're looking at right now on the Google Street View the women are not there but their position possessions are all present purses cars IDs etc and the family dog is like scared and I ha heard the report he kind of wanted to be held so the dog, they, they come in, no one's there, the women are not there, uh, you know, nothing seems out of place, uh, and uh, one thing is out of place, I will get into it, but nothing else is out of place, but the dog is kind of like in the house, all like frightened and, and things like that, so um, uh, your initial thoughts on the dog really quickly, uh, he's kind of scared, so is this like... Does, does this, is this a strong indication that something was wrong or do dogs like, I don't know, because I never had a dog, like do dogs just like do random stuff all the time? Yeah, you know, some dogs just get lonely. I mean, uh, I had, I used to have neighbors when I was like their age that I would, I would actually get hired to take care of the dog while they were on vacation. And like they would actually pay me to come stay in the house and sleep in the house so that the dog wouldn't be too lonely. So mm. I think some of that's normal. Yeah. Oh, all right. Um, okay. So now regarding the one thing that was out of place, you know, this was the lamp shade of the front porch light, which was broken. So the lamp bulb is intact. The lamp shade that covers the lamp bulb is messed up it's on the ground it's completely shattered it's broken so uh really quickly apparently this is the picture from back in the day now i'm not really certain the exact time maybe this is the crime scene picture or not now i see two 
places that could represent this lamp? And this is kind of a question to the audience members as well. Maybe you guys can tell us, because like I told Glenn, I think this is the place. And then Glenn is like, no, but look, there's something else. Maybe this is the place. This is the thing. And I was like, whoa, so which one is it? So basically what I thought it was, was this thing right here we see this like stool like little uh, not stool i'm sorry like this little uh like this little uh, i have no idea like a decorative pool yeah pole yeah like a, yeah with like a lamp and it has like a shade it it, it has like a cover right so I, I, I assume this thing was smashed but then above the mailbox we see something else here so dude your thoughts yeah, so I think when I saw one of the stories, um, they had zoomed in on that part, the part, the part by the door, and then when I when I think of the terminology, I keep thinking if the first thing, the the, the little lamp on the pole, to me that's not really the porch. To me, that's like the path or something, or you know, like it's almost like the driveway. That to me, I mean, it's funny because you know uh, some of our American houses. You know, I mean, mine included doesn't really have a porch, so they they don't really have it. Their porch is about um, eight square feet. Um, yeah. You know, what I mean, like like well, like in the old days, you could like put like a couch out out on some porches mm. for some of those places. So, but yeah, that's that's what I think of when I think of the porch. Is technically, I think of the part by the door, um, and that was actually the part that I found interesting. So. You know, as we kind of get into the story, one of the things I wondered was, and I just thought of this right now, why was the, why was the glass broken, but the bulb not broken? And I wondered if someone had broken the glass to make a noise, to attract their attention, to have them come out. And then maybe they had you with their hand, though it would be hot, maybe without a glass, unscrewed the light bulb. This is before LED lights unscrew the light bulb so that you couldn't see who was there. So then when they go to check the light, you make your move. I'm not sure. The other thing I wondered just while, while I'm still talking is um, the building next to them, like on our right, uh, from our view on their right, I was like, well, you know, breaking glass uh, the other way. Yeah. I mean, that went that way too, but also that way right there. I was like, well, and some of the things I saw the top windows of that other building can actually see over that fence. Um, not the lower ones, but like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, right up there. I don't know if that's a two story building or not. So I don't know if those are just like, you know what I mean? Like, like illumination windows and maybe not actually the ones you look through. It's such a weird building that's next to them. It almost looks like a, like a utility building or something. Right. It doesn't look like a house. I want to, I want to add a real, um, yeah. quick information. I actually did the historical view. I didn't decide to include it in the visual assets this week because, uh, the reason why I didn't want to include it is because the layout of the neighborhood literally hasn't changed at all. Uh, so what this means is that this building is kind of the same building that was back in 92. So, uh, yeah, yeah. What Glenn is saying is actually like really makes a really, really strong point here because uh, this building was here in 92. I'm certain of it. Yeah, I saw it in the footage. I mean, what is it? it, it don't, now, the more I look at it, the more I wish that I looked at it more carefully on Google Earth before we did the show because it doesn't it doesn't look like anybody lives in that thing. That almost looks like a, a, a power, like like a the DWP, you know, Department of Water and Power plant or some kind of industrial building. You know what I mean? Look at all those parking spaces in front of it. That doesn't at all look like someone lives in it. Nope. That looks like someone, what someone goes there for their day job. And even next to it, there's like a weird warehouse or something yeah there's like a storage shed in the back that to me i mean it looks like they live in like almost a semi-industrial area because that other big building across the street also it's like it's kind of a weird street now the reason why i point this out is i feel like now you have a lot more people that are coming through the area that don't necessarily live there like you know the people that come through my area i mean yeah i get weird people through my area but i don't have a whole office building or a couple of office buildings of like people Coming through there, that that office building or whatever it is you're looking at, that thing must have like 40 parking spaces or more. More, I, mean, I think it's like close to, let's say, 80, because that's a lot right. of parking spots. Whoa, that's a lot of parking. That's a lot of traffic in front of your little house, and then the other house is turned at a weird angle. Yes, you know what I mean. So the other house is like it's diagonal to it, and it doesn't look like there's any one window that has a good. So maybe whoever scoped this out, it was let's presume. 
that someone else was involved, which we're going to get into, but let's suppose someone had time to scope this out because they're going to and from one of these locations and they're noticing this weird little house. And then, you know, maybe they're also seeing who comes and goes from the house and, you know, it's like an, an attractive lady and an attractive daughter and maybe an attractive friend. And, and that's where I start to, you're correct. Oh my God, dude, you're yeah. completely correct. I co How did I completely miss this fact? Yes, you are correct. This is a building that most likely at 2 a.m. had no occupants. No one was here. Yeah. This building looks like it's a residential building for sure, but it's built in such a way that none of the win windows face the front entrance of this house. And then... Then, then you notice this thing as well, and this is like, look, there's a million cars here. So that means that random people are by the victim's home every day, right? Look, look at that big, that big picture window too, right in the front of the house. So like, people could even, maybe even see in your house from that building. And then, and then two in the morning, three in the morning, no one, no one's in these other buildings. So you've got this, you got this one house that can't see your house because the only the garage is facing your house if even and then you've got you you got everything else is like a just just dead right it's just 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 oh, and it is shielding the rest of the neighborhood from noise look how far it is out to the intersection this is like a weird little back street like this isn't just for all of you on the podcast if you watch the youtube the more i look at this the more i, I kind of really want to look at the map again especially if we would do a follow-up because this this is a weird little like the street is, it would almost be like an alley you know what i mean it's like it's almost the street is almost like an overgrown alley yes if you, if you, if you know what i mean like like it, i i wouldn't be surprised if it has sort of a weird set of addresses and things i've seen streets like this in los angeles but they're not common um i think in this kind of more rural area maybe it is more common but yeah it's a really weird little street it's not by any means a normal residential street it's a it's, a, it's like a mixed use zoning area Mm, it's actually a really uh, the, uh, it looks like a perfect place to kidnap people just because a lot of random people a lot of random traffic uh, and the house is literally like built perfectly like where you wouldn't really notice who's go going in and who's going out this is an excellent point man uh, let's jump to uh, other things now i was gonna ask you what does this mean uh the the shattered lamp but you kind of already uh, articulated an interesting uh, point now i will say i kind of find it hard to believe that that was uh, the modus operandi break the glass uh, or like unscrew the the bulb then break the glass uh, and then wait while someone comes to check in because um there's three people uh, they're all disappeared and there's no signs of a struggle i find it hard to believe uh, that was the situation i kind of strong i want to dish this out immediately before we even jump to the theories i kind of feel like this was a gun pointing situation uh and then an order get out the house uh, or and no one gets hurt but then obviously everyone gets hurt later on it was this type of a situation in my opinion now let's move uh, through the timeline um the door was unlocked so this uh, front door was also unlocked which is i would assume uh, they definitely lock their doors which is or maybe they don't but i would probably bet that you would want to lock your door especially in the neighborhood that we just described so that's probably a sign of you know kind of correlates with what i'm thinking pointing a gun at them get out the house get into my car or maybe a potentially like a van or something like that and then they don't even uh you know out of like the quick stress or whatever they don't even lock the door um and this is happening at the at the middle of the night let's remember um now uh Kirby, Janelle Kirby and her boyfriend Mike Hansen, they actually sweep up the glass, the broken glass, which later uh, was uh, a big mistake on, the, on their move, uh, because on their part, I mean, because, uh, you know, they probably contaminated the scene. And just in general, the whole scene was super contaminated. We might get into it a little bit later on. Um, but it uh, they were cleared. I don't think they were covering it up uh, because, uh, you know, it's just glass and maybe they're being it's a smaller town it's like missouri maybe it's how like uh, what people do like oh i'll just sweep their glass or whatever um now they both of them they enter the house nothing is out of the ordinary but now phone calls phone calls immediately start being received by the family 
uh, by uh, Cheryl's um, house phone. And these phone calls are apparently some sort of prank phone calls with like sexual innuendos, uh, explicit uh, explicit language is also used uh, and it's coming from a masculine voice, a male masculine voice. She hangs up, then she gets the same prank caller, then she hangs up uh, again. So police believes that these prank calls of like sexual, like uh, explicit content were unconnected and were prank calls because apparently back in the early 90s, prank calls like this was like kind of a big thing because you didn't have like any way to track these uh, phone calls that well so maybe it's like a kind of a regular thing i mean you grew up in the 90s you have any more ideas on these two phone calls i mean i mean yeah no i mean yeah for sure there's always been prank calls and you know simpsons used to always make fun of prank calls i i never really had any um I don't know if I knew anybody that did me, but I guess the one thing that struck me is if it was a prank call, weren't these like the unluckiest people ever to make a prank call right during a, a major crime scene, potentially, yeah. or disappearance? I, to me, it's, I don't know, it's kind of a weird coincidence. So that's just my thought on that. Yeah. Um, from, this, from these two pictures, on the left side, we have a picture of... Uh, Cheryl Levitt's bed, it seemed like it had been slept in. So sh we kind of strongly believe that Cheryl has went to bed at some point during the night. Um, on the right side, we see a picture of Suzanne's room. It's kind of a messy-ish room, I would say, but it's like, I guess, you know, uh, a typical, I wouldn't say it's like a, something out of the ordinary, just a typical teenager room, I would say. Uh, everything looks kind of, you know, typical. Uh, so that's uh, what these pictures are. Now, uh, Janice McCall, Stacy's mother, at 10.30 a.m., she's already worried. Why is Stacy not calling me? Because Stacy promised to call me the next day. So the mother, Janice McCall, she calls Janelle Kirby's residence because at that point she still believes that both girls spent the night at Janelle Kirby's. She apparently did not know that the two girls decided to go back to Suzanne's house, you know, to sleep at Cheryl Levitt's home. So at Janelle Kirby's residence, when she calls them, they tell her that she that the two girls went back and stayed at Levitt's home. So she's like, okay, this is weird. Why didn't Stacy tell me about this? Whatever. Now, at some unknown time, Janice McCall arrives at Levitt's home and she also will be a witness of something really suspicious and strange, but then she messed it up. Uh, but let's go. Uh, the women are still absent at the house. She sees no signs of struggle. She's thinking, where is everyone? What is happening here? Now, at some point in time, uh, she calls police uh, and she tells them, yo, this is some crazy stuff. So she uh, gives them like the lowdown of what she knows. She sees that Stacy's items are at the house, uh, that, you know, uh, both girls had made it home apparently during the night because let's remember their cars are parked in the parking spaces so everyone assumes that they made it back home uh, everyone assumes that they they, they they went to bed but now they're missing but then after calling the police and giving them the lowdown she goes and checks the answering machine because i mean she's worried so yeah so i think it's normal at first i was like yo this kind of kind of weird like this janice uh, mccall uh, you know uh, the the mother of one of the victims she's kind of acting really touchy at the house but then i'm thinking 
I probably would do the same thing. I'd be like, yo, let's search the the, the entirety of this house because at that point you're you're thinking that maybe they're not gonna be missing for the next twenty eight years. Uh, you're 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 just thinking, okay, where are they? I, I kind of want to know where they're they're at. So you're not thinking rationally. You kind of want to know what's happening as soon as possible. So she checks the the phone. And you know how they're like phone, uh, phone, like you could leave like a phone message uh, that you could listen to. So she hears a strange uh, message with like same sexual explicit comments on the answering machine. But then she apparently erases it and law enforcement has never had a chance to listen to that message left on, on the message machine. Now, why I, I will want to ask your opinion really quickly, but like uh, how, what I want to say is that and actually a question to you as well from my research the two previous prank calls that janelle kirby answered are not connected to this answering machine message that janice mccall heard and accidentally erased it meaning it's two different people doing two different pranks on the same day when everyone goes missing i mean the coincidences are pretty crazy, in my opinion. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. To me, it seems like they're connected to each other, and given some of the suspects, may actually be connected to, if not the suspect, suspect that did it, somebody who was, let's say, a malefactor in Miss um, Levitt's life, let's say. Right. Uh, now we have another picture, and actually, I wish I kind, of, I kind of wish we already went through this picture a little bit earlier, because on the right hand side, now I'm definitely going with your your theory, dude. Look, this definitely looks like you were correct. Uh, this looks like it's the 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 lamp that was smashed, because we could see like, you know, just above the mailbox there is this uh, lamp bulb, but it doesn't have a cover. Yeah. I will jump in though. It is interesting because I feel like this timeline i don't know if i got confused in my research or if the timeline has amended maybe something that you know the earlier videos about this topic said because i i had thought that um that you know Miss, mrs mccall was in the loop the entire time for you know where um where stacy was 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 the entire night but That's yeah but this, this is yeah, this this is giving a different story that, you know, post Kirby, um, she didn't really know what was going on with her. Yes. So that's, yeah. I just want to say excellent point because I kind of was also before reading out this timeline in the back of my head. Yo, I thought that Janice knew that Stacy was going to Suzanne's, so I kind of, kind of will agree with you. No, no, like for sure agree with you. I'm sorry because I I feel like that's the case. So. Once again, super choppy, super messy case, guys. If ever, if something's not one hundred percent accurate, pardon us, but I think we're keeping it very accurate, at least ge generally so far. And now look at the picture on the left. This is the three purses. So, uh, the three purses. I'm not sure if this is the crime scene picture because apparently the police only entered the house like what two days later. And within the time frame of police receiving the notification of something being wrong and then entering the house, which was like a good two days or something like that apart, there were up to 10 to 20 people inside, of, inside the house contaminating the scene. So I'm kind of curious, what do you think about the, the, the layout of the... Uh, the three purses that you can see, these are the three purses that belong to the three women. Uh, do we kind of think this is exactly how they were left uh, when, you know, Janelle Kirby and her boyfriend first entered the house? Or do you think this is like a, like a product of uh, a lot of unnecessary crime scene contamination? Yeah, I think the latter. I mean, I, I, the way they were described in the research was that oh they were all lined up and it was really weird and then yeah you look at that and it just looks like oh three people threw their their stuff together but the fact that everyone else seems to have this inventory of what was in the purses i do not think that they were at all good about putting things back where they found them 
So, mm. or, you know what I mean? I, I'm sure that whatever, regardless, even if you try to be really careful, you're going to contaminate the crime scene in a lot of different ways just by, by moving it, even if you think you're putting it back yeah. in the exact same place. One thing, one thing, Sherry Levitt had 900 bucks in her purse. Okay, so uh, this immediately kind of makes me think maybe this was not intended to be a robbery because let's remember nothing seems to be missing besides the woman and Cheryl Levitt had 900 nine big ones in her purse and they're still there so it's kind of don't you think it's kind of weird the, the, this definitely seems like an abduction and not a uh, robbery gone bad let's say right yeah, I mean, the house isn't ransacked or anything, right? It doesn't appear that anything of value was taken. Cars, everything's there. Uh, nothing seems to be missing besides, like, the, the, the lamp on the, the lamp cover on the uh, porch is shattered. Um, so, you know, she deletes it, whatever, whatever. Uh, then at 2.50 a.m., she deletes uh, the message uh, 2.50 a.m. in the evening of on June 8th, so even the next day she uh, files a police report for missing women investigation launches and that's kind of this kind of all we have uh that this is like the story uh, the women have not been like uh, you know they have been missing haven't been found for a lot of years it's like they completely vanished a little bit and yeah i'm, I'm glad i'm done with the timeline I, I'm not even sure. I have some questions. Uh, before we jump into the questions part, uh, anything you want to add uh, to the timeline or shall we jump to the questions? No, I think it's perfect. Questions are perfect right now. Okay, dude. So uh, I think, you know, you have a few questions. I, how about you go through yours and then I go through mine? Because like this week we kind of structured it like uh, you added yours first and then I have a few of mine. So yeah, I, I don't want to like ran over your questions if you like have, you know, the ability to like read them out uh, right now because uh, yeah. they're in the notes. So yeah. Yes, yeah, so totally. And I guess we'll do questions and then we'll do theories, which probably leads perfectly into some of the suspects or so people that have come up of interest. So, yeah, yeah you know, we mentioned the, the porch light and it was like, well, was that significant? Was it something co completely coincidental? I mean, the way people reacted when they got there, it seems like it wasn't normal for there to be broken stuff at the house. Um, but I was just wondering, like, how would that even happen? If someone hadn't gone out of their way to do it, I mean, the only, it's like, a, the, I already gave the one idea about maybe some kind of setup to make noise and, and unscrew the bulb so that when they come out, they, they see it. Or, you know, there's another scenario where if somebody pretends to be, let's say, a utility worker, like, like oh, I'm here to check the gas. There's a gas leak. It's three in the morning. I mean, oh, I'm going to go take care of it. Let me in your house. And the guy's got a uniform on, which is one of the theories we're going to get into. Well, then maybe neutralizing that light and making it less visible helps you? I don't know. I don't know. It seems weird. So the only other thing I thought of was if you were carrying somebody who was tied up over your shoulder and you were carrying them like maybe head over, you know what I mean? So like it's kind of weird, but if you were carrying them the other way, you were carrying somebody so that their feet were behind you over your shoulder, maybe their feet could hit the the light cover it's it's i know it's it's, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit can i can yeah. i uh, because i just realized i missed a insanely crucial point in the timeline and it will kind of like really go well with what you're saying right now and that crucial detail is that if i'm not mistaken suzanne's suzanne streeter's car was parked not where it is parked usually because you know it's her house she knows where she parks her car all the time like everyone knows where she parks her car all the time she has the same spot where she parks it all the time this particular night it wasn't parked now we have uh i don't know if this is the correct placement of the 
cars and which car belongs to who. I have no idea. But I know that I think Suzanne's car, because someone's definitely, so it has to be Suzanne's. Suzanne's car was parked in a place where it's not parked all the time. And why is this suspicious? Because like uh, when you just like hear this information, you're like, okay, so what's what's up with that? So who cares? Like, but no, let's imagine maybe there was another car already parked in Suzanne Streeter's area where she likes to park her car. That would mean that there's a third party already in the house with Cheryl Levitt when the girls arrive at 2 a.m. Now, this kind of doesn't correlate with a few things. Doesn't correlate with the fact that Cheryl Levitt's uh, bed seems that she has already slept in. So she, if she had guests or like workers or whatever, or maybe it does correlate. Maybe it does correlate. Maybe she like woke up uh, at the middle of the night. Who knows when they entered? Okay, sc scratch that. Maybe it does make sense. But still, the 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 lamp shattering. If this was a situation like a Trojan horse situation where there's someone coming inside of the house pretending to be a friend, a family member, or like a utility worker, uh, and then whips out a gun and it's like, yo, get out the house, get in my car, let's 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 go, let's go, quick, quick, quick. If that's the case, then why is the lamp shattered? Um, as you've said, you kind of explained it. Now in my head, you kind of explained it. You kind of said like maybe as someone was like kind of rushing and brushing out the house maybe they kind of clip clip the lamp and then that's how the lamp uh like gets kind of destroyed maybe that makes sense okay so so, so all i'm gonna say is yeah i kind of uh, as i just went i kind of answered my own question so maybe it's not that suspicious okay but whatever the uh, uh, sh uh, sh uh suzanne's car is parked not where it's usually parked that's what i'm gonna say man and yeah continue yeah, well, I mean, that's perfect you went through it because that's sort of like deductive reasoning. And it's good to hear that, I think, that train of thought um, for, for where that reasoning comes from. Um, so, yeah, perfect. Uh, the, so the, another thing was, you know, we just mentioned the purse, purses. So there was a couple weird things with the purses. So purses all in a row, at least according to <laughs> witness testimony before they contaminated the crap out of the scene. Um, money still in purse. And then apparently... Um, both uh, 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 Suzanne Streeter and um, Cheryl Levitt were both at this point chain smokers, which, you know, <laughs> that's not really good parenting, by the way. So that, you know, I, 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 just as a side note, that's what makes me kind of not feel so good about um, Miss Streeter there. Or, 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 sorry, Miss Levitt, Cheryl Levitt, is, is that, I don't know. I, your, your kid really shouldn't be smoking at that age. Um, and then the chain smoking thing is uh, whatever. But it, <laughs> for whatever, whatever. I, I know. I, I'm I, wearing, I know. Right? I know. We're, 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 we're going to have all these, all these angry cigarette yeah, smokers. Come on, man. Hey, it's, Glenn, go to hell. On, I mean, man. hey, hey, you know, it, it's, it's going to kill you. And, and, it's, and we only smoke because of propaganda. So that's just my two cents about that. <laughs> those, those cigars. I don't mind cigars. Cigars are great because that's quality tobacco. But yeah, no, cigarettes are, are, are freaking coffin nails. Um, yeah, so anyway, but the, I think we all know, though, a chain smoker cannot stand to be away from cigarettes, right? For sure, because it's a major addiction. Yeah. Uh, it's an addiction to nicotine and sticking a chimney in your mouth. So yeah, like, so that was right away. There's like all the cigarettes and stuff were still in their purses. So that right away was another surefire giveaway. So... I'm saying this because I'm starting to build a case just the same way with deductive reasoning that you did earlier that it makes you start to check off what doesn't seem like a motive. So it doesn't seem like a financial motive and it doesn't seem like anything was taken to like sustain the people that disappeared. Yes. You know what I mean? So like the things that these people needed for comfort, like if you were going to take somebody with you for like another life or something like that, you know, say, say they ran away, they would take their cigarettes, right? You would at mm. least take your cigarettes even if you wanted to, like, leave everything else behind. That doesn't sound like anybody was intended to live very long, let's say, if they made them disappear. All right. Um, and then I, I'm going to I'm gonna kind of save one of these other questions for after we get into yeah. some of the other theories. But I will say, just, just really quickly going through the rest of these, prank calls, are the prank calls connected 
I think, yeah. I think they're, they're either connected to the actual quote-unquote crime, if there's a crime, or connected to some of the bad guys that were in um, Cheryl Levitt's life. Um, and then, yeah, like, like I think in terms of the, the like, th- yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, I mean, I guess, I guess I think that's it right now. I mean, for, for now, I'd like, I think it'd be better for me to turn it back over to you so I can save some of this ammo for later in the show. Yeah. Uh, just really quickly, just to go through the questions that I had lined out, because my questions are like more like, um, really short questions that's just like a yes or no question so i think we could like really quickly breeze through past mine so yeah are the phone calls connected uh you say yeah i kind of say i have no idea because uh, maybe it's a weird coincidence i don't know comments in the comments guys leave your thoughts now why were there no sign of a struggle so really quickly in my opinion the only way is gun in the face and get out the house get in the car so your opinion uh, what other way could an abduction of three people lead to no signs of struggle even after contamination of the scene like would you still not see at least one strange thing because like the people the next day didn't they didn't see anything strange i think it's like a gun to the face get out the house type of a situation yeah i agree i mean i can't think of I mean, nothing even other than that one little thing seems broken. And the thing that was broken doesn't seem like the kind of thing that would be broken in like a physical struggle. Mm. So, yeah, there was either massive coercive pressure used. I mean, it had to be that. It couldn't even be like, oh, just come in this car. We're going to go for a ride. I think like to your point, it's like one of you is going to die right now if you don't do what I say. Mm. Exactly. Uh, Now, uh, the purses are all lined up. Is this normal, in my opinion? I will say probably not normal, but it still could happen in a normal setting. I guess they just line them up. Uh, your opinions? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I could see, I mean, it's kind of, I'm not really sure what the custom is out there, but I assume, you know, like when people come to my house and it's almost always like the, the mothers of my, my kids' friends, um, I feel like they just all put their, either either take their purse around with them in the house but I think if you're just being comfy together and less formal, maybe you do just drop them all in one place. Exactly. Uh, uh, Stacy McCall's mother uh, reviewed a voice message left on Levis answering machine and listened to a mail caller who had left a quote-unquote strange message on the phone. What was so strange about the message? And it is connected. I did make this question before I continued on into my further research, then forgot to delete this question. I wasn't supposed to even have this question in the section anymore because I feel like we already hashed it out. And I feel like there's, uh, it's, it wasn't of a sexual nature and it was a kind of a prank as well a little bit. It's really unclear because... Um, law enforcement never listen to it so it's only we can only speculate we won't get really anywhere with speculating about this particular detail because it's just no way of telling last question and this is another crazy horror movie detail this is the horror movie detail of this case that i was referring to another thing noted was that the television had been turned on but was not on any channel just a fuzzy screen because you know there are like some channels uh that if you like go flip through the remote and and then you go to like channels that are not like supported uh, by your uh cable provider or whatever it's gonna be a fuzzy screen so it was left on and it was fuzzy how do you explain that dude because it was not i just want to quickly say it was not a tv station that is fuzzy some it was not a channel that would be fuzzy for some period of time and then would not be fuzzy on another period of time. It's like 24 hours per day, it's fuzzy and it's like this fuzzy screen. It's, it shows nothing. So it couldn't have showed anything even during the evening. So it's not like they got abducted and forgot to turn it off. It was literally fuzzy even then. So it, how do you explain that, man? Yeah, I, I think I, it's funny. I just thought of it this this moment so all right turning back time um nobody had dvd players in 1992 nobody had even like well, almost nobody had laser disc players if you know what those are yeah. um th- so this is i don't did, did you ever own a vcr 
I think so, yeah. But, but it's like way okay. back in the day. Yeah. Way back in the day. So maybe this is like for people closer to my age, this will be memory lane. When you had a VCR, you would put it on either two or three. So one of those two channels almost always was a non-station. That's why they set it like that. So your VCR would have like a little switch. So you would turn it to two or three so that there was no signal. So if you were going to watch something on the VCR, you would have it like on channel three and that's fuzzy. And then you turn on your VCR and it kicks right in. Does that make sense? So yeah. you didn't even have like a, there wasn't even like, like an input setting on your TV back then. It was literally like you plugged in your, your VCR to this thing and it went through, I think like it went through the cable box and then you turn on your VCR and you would play the VCR and that would be the signal in, into your cable like input in the back of your TV because there was no station there. So that's, that's my explanation. So, uh, so, so, what's, when, when, uh, so, so what's the premise here? The premise is they come back home and they, they try to watch some movies or something. Yeah. That's what I, th I mean, for sure. Because that, that was, that was like the main source of entertainment. Like if nothing was on cable and if you don't, maybe you don't even have cable. But everybody had a VCR in 1992. I yeah. mean, some of us had like more than one attached to your TV if you're copying tapes or something. I just think maybe that was part of her TV thing. Even the fact that she left the TV on at night mm. to sleep, maybe you put on something like kind of relaxing because there's no YouTube yet, right? So you put on something relaxing that you can just fall asleep to. And then when it when it like is over, it just flips off and it's like... Shh, so last you know, thing... Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's great dude uh, lastly then it's kind of we don't think that the, 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 the perpetrator or perpetrators like left it there as like a, trying to make the scene even look creepier it's it just happened it's like it's unrelated that's what I'm trying to say we, you would yeah. say it's unrelated right yeah exactly I think because I, I would say why not do the opposite if I was a killer why not do like what you see in so many movies where you actually turn up the volume to cover the noise of whatever you're doing. Mm, all right, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of makes sense. Now let's jump to the theories and I guess like the suspects. Um, so I know we have a, a bunch of suspects. I kind of have like uh, the the ex boyfriends of one of the girls. Uh, kind of lined up really nicely so i, I just want to quickly read this one out because i know you also have some information but i just want to quickly i have like this really nicely uh nicely laid out information about these people so this would be dustin reckler michael clay and joseph riedel so dustin reckler known as dusty is a former boyfriend of suzanne streeter you know one of the missing women Dustin Reckla was charged with felony institutional vandalism. Reckla is accused of breaking into a mausoleum. Pardon me, Springfield's Maple Park Cemetery on February 30, 21st, 1992. So February 21st. This is like shortly before the disappearances, like only a handful of months before the disappearances. Uh, now during the vandalism he stole skulls and some bones this is insane i will get into it shortly with you um michael clay was charged with felony institutional vandalism as well for literally the same charge and then joseph riedel literally the same charge uh police have said that dustin reckler you know, the ex-boyfriend of Suzanne sold 26 grams of gold teeth fillings from the schools at a Springfield pawn shop for 30 bucks. Suzanne Streeter gave a statement to officers investigating the vandalism on March 5th. So she kind of like a little bit like snitched on, on the guy, but it's like normal because it's like, you know, who cares? But like he kind she kind of like snitched on the guy a little bit. So uh, the theory is he's mad that, that she snitched on him and, 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 you know, they came and abducted them. Well, I will say I find it insanely creepy you going into a graveyard, digging up like skulls and 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 getting like fillings out of like the th the tooth just for like thirty bucks. I know it's like ninety two uh, money, but still thirty bucks for all of that stuff. I mean, that's kind of crazy, don't you think? Yeah, it is crazy, and I I think this is where like a little bit of weirdness comes in. 
this, at least one of the shows that I watched for the era. Apparently, one of these guys had like some kind of like Satanism type material, like a poster or something, uh, in his house. So then it, it, I want to set a little bit of context in the 80s, mostly the 80s, but even into the 90s, there was sort of a big like Satanism scare. So, you know, I think partially because of like movies um, that had come out in like the 70s and also because we're talking about the Bible Belt here. So we're talking about the most religious part of the United States. My thought is if you're a bad guy, even if you don't actually believe in Satanism, and I, I, I honestly feel that the people, even the people that, 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 that say they do, I feel like they're just doing it, doing it to shock other people. Like, like they're doing it because they're mad at their mommy. Does that make sense? So like, just, I, I don't know if you know this, but like punk rockers in the seventies, used to like wear swastikas and stuff and i don't i don't think most of them were actually anti-semitic or like you know believed in national socialism or whatever you know what i mean mm. i don't think they were actually i think i think they were literally trying to outrage their parents because their parents were like you know had come out of that world war ii era like highly incensed by it so the same in the same way i could see guys like we're just describing who would rob graves I mean, maybe, maybe, but, but, but I think it, it gets a little weird there because I, like I said, I, I think in our, in our notes, I'd asked you, is this something that ever comes up? I don't know if this is like, like mostly an American phenomena where these, these Satanism scares crop up in the news where like an animal will be killed or there'll be some kind of ritual. Mm. And then there was a really, maybe it's worth us covering. I don't know. Cause it's a little bit of a weird topic, but there was an infamous case here in here in California of a preschool that got got accused of like all this Satanism stuff. And it was a complete sham. It was in the eighties. It's kind of crazy to think it happened in my state, which is normally so liberal, but yeah, like all these, like all these, these, um, <laughs> it was just a crazy thing. It's, it's a long story, but yeah, what happens is, you know, there's things called moral panics that are sort of like witch hunts. And I don't mean witch hunts, like real witch hunts. I mean like what we see now in politics where people get really disturbed about a topic that isn't necessarily true. And that's when, when this topic came up, they even said it in some of the research that are like, well, that just right away made people feel weird about the whole thing. And it almost makes me wonder if they were a little reluctant to dig more into these guys and just told them like, look, just shut up and take the, take the plea. And like, you know, let's, let's, let's be, be rid of this. Cause we don't really want to dig too much more in your personal lives mm. because it's so, dangerous. but then, but then again, uh, really quickly, cause I, I don't want us to get off track. Uh, would these, uh, would these, uh, kids, cause they're like essentially 18 or whatever, would they have the necessary tools to get everyone out of the house really cleanly? Like, I mean, they're robbing graves. I mean, because I think, okay, so maybe they rush in the house with, like, knives if they don't have the, 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 the guns. Because, like, hmm, maybe it's a, it's a situation like that. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, to me, in, a, in one way, they have the motive and then they have, like, better logistics, right? So, yeah, you're right that they're not, they don't really seem very smooth. They're doing stupid crimes. They so, like from the, yeah, they get caught. They don't seem to have the precision that maybe another suspect we're about to talk about has, but they do have the motive, right? Because they were gonna. I think um, it's interesting because I, I think one of the notes says that actually Mrs. Lo Lovett, Ms. Lovett, um, Cheryl was gonna testify against them. Was scheduled. One of the mm. one of the the uh, one of the the videos I watched said that she was scheduled to like actually testify yes. against them. Yes. Um, so, I mean, they have a reason to do something and, and apparently from these other, other sources we have, they're in some kind of motorcycle gang and it's like, you know, which, which also, by the way, that, that actually kind of makes more sense to me. Some of like, cause the motorcycle gangs but, are notorious for like, you know, do over the top stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, so, just yeah. just really quickly, just not get uh, just uh, because I have this thought and I will not have it, uh, so I have to step in here and ask you: Is the risk to reward ratio uh, logical here, even for eighteen year old? You're gonna get, uh, uh, you're gonna go to trial for a crime that you obviously did, 
uh, because you kind of sold the, the the gold to the pawns uh, pawn shop, so it's not like you're gonna beat the case anyway. So you don't really care if they're gonna get testified. But now you're gonna kill and abduct w people, which is like you know that's like a life sentence or like a death sentence, even more more likely. So it's like, is the risk to reward ratio logical here? Um, given the fact that maybe they wanna show off to the biker gang, yo, let's kill these these people, yeah. Yeah. but it's like is still like the risk to reward ratio is kind of not there at least for me personally i mean i i don't disagree i think you're right i just unfortunately at that age i've seen even stupider crimes happen when especially when when more than one teenage guy is involved just like you said the the very social aspect of it and reputational aspect of it very often especially in gangs but, you know, just for young men in general can make them do something stupid that you said, like, yeah, the, 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 the ROI on it is terrible. Yeah. It's not at all worth it. But, you know, we see shootings in the streets of our cities here all the time that are over stupid things like that. So, yeah, I don't I don't totally absolve them of the ability to do something stupid and horrible just because of that, especially if they're involved in some level of organized crime. Yeah, so that's those guys. We have a one one dude who we definitely need to talk about. But before we talk about that dude, I have two other dudes. And they are okay. So one is Steve Eugene Garrison. I have to mention him because he he is mentioned in the Streeter family blog. So uh, really quickly, his connection is that he tells police at some point that a friend of his has confessed to him uh, to killing the woman and now this Steve Eugene Garrison who learns apparently learns this information from his friend that that friend killed the woman he gives this information back to police and he apparently gives uh, information uh, that law enforcement has not released to the public so they're kind of yo this guy knows way too much so maybe this is there's something something's here um now uh so the information to police uh led police investigators to serve a three three search warrants at two sites in western uh, webster county webster county was a county right next to springfield to the a little bit to the east uh that uh yeah so basically uh they do three search warrants they don't find anything um he, this man uh steve eugene uh, garrison also said uh that a moss green van was believed to be used in the abduction now the green van really quickly dude i think you had more information on the green van just like without stopping here for too long uh like what's with the green van apparently some woman the next day saw suzanne streeter driving this green van and she also heard voices in the green van telling her yo just keep going keep going or something like that right yeah there was this was one of two unconfirmed reports of the activities that happened. The, the other one was right before they, they went to the house. They were supposedly stopped at their favorite restaurant and looked kind of out of it. But yeah, this one was eerie, if it's true, supposedly. Yeah, it almost seemed like um, Suzanne was driving and then the, the, there was like a voice in the back of her, like, you know, maybe somebody with a gun or something threatening her, whatever, whatever you could imagine. Some way of... Of, of threatening the person to keep driving that like maybe she had made like a wrong turn somewhere and he was telling her like don't panic don't do anything stupid now just go turn around and you know so there was it's kind of weird though like how would you how would you hear that if i guess unless the windows were open by the way this this van i was kind of amazed that this is an american made van because it looks to me so much like i don't know more like a van from like your part of the world like it looks looks almost like an Eastern European van. Does it look that way to you? It looks like a, one of those German back in the day VW vans, if you know what I mean. Volkswagens, a little bit. It kind of looks like yeah, maybe maybe that's what that's kind of the the prototype of something like that. I don't know. For some reason, I always imagine like this being more of a Central or Eastern European model. But I I guess it was it, it was it was like like a Dodge or something from like 1965 to 1970. 
I, I have a question. If this is correct, like the, the, the sighting, then why is the perpetrator letting uh, one of the victims drive the van? Isn't that kind of not what, what vans are meant for when you are a kidnapper? That's kind of where you, like the van is where you store the victims. You don't actually let them drive the van, you know? Yeah, I mean, to me, if it is a kidnapper, to me, that sounds like they may not all be tied up and he may have to make, because he hasn't had time to, to tie them up because then he'd have to carry them in a van, et cetera. Maybe that person was paranoid enough to think he might get seen mm. doing that or not even necessarily, I don't know, not, not have the, the implements to tie them up with. So from that point of view, maybe he's planning to have them all in the van with him. He has the gun on the driver and the other two are just gonna, you know, shut up or the driver's gonna get it. And then once he gets to wherever it is he wants to go, he's gonna execute all of them. Mm. Okay, so going back to uh, Gene, Steve Eugene Garrison, going back to him and how this man connects, because he tells that he believes that this man was used in the abduction. So, you know, he's linking the van as well. Uh, and also uh, a little bit of uh, information on Steve Eugene, Eugene Garrison. He is serving a 40-year prison sentence for raping and sodomizing and terrorizing a female Springfield College student in the summer of 1993. Uh, so I guess that's why he's uh, one of the suspects, because he apparently tells the cops, yo, I know of a guy who did it, but then a cop's thinking that he actually did it, because how does he know all of this information? And the, the guy who he squealed on, I guess, never came out, and there was nothing here, so it's like a weird, like a crazy... Uh, insane man Steve Eugene Garrison does a sexual assault is now sitting in prison perhaps he's dead by now or something like that the next man would be Gerald Carnahan and Gerald Carnahan is also in prison I think he's serving a life sentence as well uh, once again, another man from the area, I think uh, the audience members can maybe look into him a little bit more if they want. There's actually a lot of information about him on the Streeter family blog. Now, I don't particularly think he's connected. That's why I don't really want to spend too much time uh, telling, uh, going through his whole story. But, you know, he's just a guy who also, like, uh, apparently does crazy stuff in Springfield, is uh, uh, booked for the murder of uh, some uh, of a murder of a uh, college of a college student named Jackie Jones oh no not called college student I'm sorry Jackie Jones who was 25 uh, who was uh, or maybe she was a college student my, my bad like this timeline on my end is getting choppy but Gerald Carnahan is only caught 25 years after the 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 deed so he starts a family has two daughters and then when the daughters are like six and eight they pin it on him you're going to jail for the rest of your life um and um the family cries uh, at like the you know the judge the the attorney asks the judge yo can um Gerald Carnahan speak to his family one last time before he's being sent off and the judge is like doesn't even reply and then then Carnahan is like booked into jail so he's a, that's a whole dramatic scene apparently being described here on the blog everyone could read it up so another dude really crazy dude does crazy stuff could be potentially linked but I think the real man who we need to discuss is Robert Craig Cox so um dude you have any because i have some information but i want to ask maybe you have uh like because i think you may have a little bit more information on on robert craig cox so uh yeah dude your uh your take on that guy if if you have something to tell us yeah i mean I'll, i can just jump right into him based on on what we have and to me he really is the strongest suspect i mean i would put a, a really high percentage so is Imagine this, this guy hits all of these different major criteria for someone that could do this kind of crime because he literally has done it <laughs> like multiple times. So, okay, first of all, becomes an army ranger in 1978 and he's apparently like soldier of the year that year. Um, 
which is interesting because one, you know, so an army ranger is, um, this is like, like a really high level, um, soldier. It's kind of a form of special forces. Um, it's not like a Navy SEAL, but it's kind of in that the same ballpark. Um, this is somebody that learns a lot of skills. The tests they have to pass are extremely hard. They have some kind of massive hike they have to pass at the end of the whole program. Um, and, you know, they've always said that people with psychopathy are often attracted to um, things like special forces because uh, they're, they're, when you're a psychopath, you're actually understimulated. You have a lower than normal heart rate. You're not as affected by fear or excitement. Um, and I almost wonder if someone like that craves excitement. Now, this isn't to denigrate all of our soldiers and especially people in special forces because psychopaths are not necessarily evil people. Psychopathy is a, is a, um, like a psychological term and not everybody that has maybe the absence of empathy doesn't mean that they're, <laughs> they're intentionally looking to, to be cruel. But when you combine the two psychopathy and a need for stimulation with cruelty, um, and to do extreme things, well, okay, that's when you come up with this guy. So yeah, he's been charged since then. Uh, or been under suspicion of several robberies, kidnappings, and murder. So he had 1978 murder of Sharon Zellers, who was 19 in Florida, convicted, and then the judgment overturned by the Florida Supreme Court for lack of evidence, which, you know, probably was some kind of travesty of justice, frankly. Um, and by the way, that's like right after he became an army ranger. So this guy right away, like right away, being an army ranger wasn't good enough for him. He had to go start murdering people. Um, 1985, California assault and kidnappings. The women escaped, convicted, served seven years. So right there, there's him taking people captive and not securing them apparently or not securing them well enough and they get away and he gets convicted. And then 1992 killings um, suspected of a, of a, of a young, uh, the I-70 killings, young, petite, brunette women from robbery and murder. Now, I don't understand how he's convicted in 85 and serves nine years, but is doing this in 92. So I don't know. Wait, could, could you, this, could you, could you quickly yeah. uh, go back? What is he uh, booked for in 85? We kind of, uh, 85, it was for, for assault and kidnappings. It says women escaped. It says convicted, served nine years. But I've, you know, like if we just do the math, 1992 is, you know, less than nine years from 85. So I don't know if he got, seven years. Uh, maybe he is got, this good behavior? Maybe. Maybe, yeah, maybe maybe credit for time served while awaiting trial. It could be because the served nine years part sounds like he served nine years, but maybe you're right. Maybe that's it's not accurate the way they put it, or maybe he got credit because often sometimes for some of these cases, if you're not bailed, if you can't get bail, like you'll sit in jail for sometimes two, three years before you even have trial, depending on what your lawyer is is trying to get done for you um, while before the case. Um, Okay, so 1993, there's some Texas murders he's suspected of. And finally, in 1994, 1995, he robbed a woman and child with a gun in Texas, attempted to enter the apartment of a young woman. Now, the, and he was sentenced to life in prison. And according to this note, he has a chance of parole in 2025. Uh, real quick, real quick, uh, back in 92... He was living in Springfield because all of these crimes are happening like kind of all over the place. We have Florida, we have uh, we have uh, Texas, but back in '92, he was living in Springfield, uh, right? I think I'm correct. I think that's that's true. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I believe that he actually. It says here. Well, no, here's the thing that's confusing. It says previously worked at the same car lot as her father. The her father part. I think is supposed to be um, Cheryl. Stacy, Stacy. It's Stacy. I, I remember. It's it's. Is it, Stacey, is it Stacey Streeter? Yeah. Okay. It's not. So, it's it's Stacy. It's Stacy McCall, uh, not Suzanne Streeter, but Stacy oh. McCall's father. Stacy McCall's father worked at like a car sales place, I believe, and he worked at the same place. And now Stacy McCall would bring food to her father. And her father was working with the same guy with with you know uh, with uh, with Robert Craig Cox. So Robert Craig Cox worked with Stacy's father, 
and Stacy would come to the job sometimes. So Robert mm. could have seen her before and maybe had some personal information. Yeah, or just or or decided. I mean, let me just say it's somebody somebody like that who already has this whole other skill set. I mean, that just becomes a challenge, right? For someone like that who's a predator, a known predator, convicted predator and murderer. Um, to me, that person decides to, uh, well, let me say, oh, the, the, the murder part, let me say, apparently was overturned. So, but anyways, a known, a known convicted predator. Um, to me, that's like the joy of the hunt for that person, right? Mm. To find out, oh, oh, pretty girl came, you know, came came to my work oh who's she oh, i'm just gonna oh, i'm gonna find out a little more find out a little more find out a little more. and then you know what i mean like and then i think someone like that that's the whole point of this i think it seems like uh, unfortunately this person's a little bit short-sighted or they they value the experience the stimulation over the long-term consequences of their actions but we've already seen that's been his habit i mean i would even argue Signing up for something like special forces, there's some some higher chance than normal that it's not going to end well for you, right? Yeah. Um, so you know, just yeah. war or something like that. So yeah, I mean, you know, what I mean, in war, a soldier already has a higher risk of something happening of to course. them. If you're special forces, you're doing the dangerous stuff. So yeah. yeah. Uh, just really quickly to throw it back to you immediately, uh, this uh, kidnapping is happening not in Stacy's home. It's happening in uh, Suzanne's home. So if uh, this is the link, if Stacy is the link, then it's kind of weird how um, this guy Robert Cox would know that Stacy, because under this assumption he's hunting Stacy, he's not hunting Susan. So it would be kind of weird how he knew that Stacy was going to be at Suzanne's home. But then again, it kind of makes sense. Maybe he already like bookmarked this date, and he was like maybe tra trailing her the whole evening and looking where she's going. Oh, she's going to Suzanne's house. All right, this is this looks good. He quickly scopes out the area. Looks that this is a perfect place for an abduction. No windows are like kind of, uh, you know positioned in such a way like no one's gonna see me I'm, I'm going to do this so maybe that's the case right yeah i mean uh I, I gotta watch how i say this but i think sometimes people can really underestimate the mindset let's say the stalker mindset or the obsessive mindset mm. so when someone gets really interested in something and really puts their heart into it i think that Almost anybody. I mean, it almost sounds like a motivational speech for like scumbags. But yeah, it's like it's like you know, you people can get very creative, and you know, almost just just like a private investigator, right? So a private investigator will tell somebody and find out all about that person, and like pretty soon they know their habits, they know who who they know, they do a little bit of what's called network analysis. So then you know, and I bet you this place popped up where the, the person's like, oh, wow, I've done this. You know, the, the, the Robert Cox or whoever it was is like, oh, yeah, I've done this before. This place is perfect. Look at that. Industrial building to the to the, the, the right of it. Commercial building across the street that nobody's in. No one's even in these two places next to it. It's kind of boxed in. There's not a lot of through traffic through this street. This other house, who even knows if anybody's home there? And then, as I understand it, this guy had like all the uniforms and stuff of like a utility worker and then there was something that came up in this research where apparently this was even supposedly a ruse he might have used before where Jesus that where, where like so imagine that you know he stakes this out he knows that, that, that these people hang out together and then you know fortuitously this evening turns out the way it is maybe he was doing surveillance right. on them mm. yeah so all right, all right. Yeah, so this guy, you're making a absolutely good case. Just to finish off on this guy, he apparently now is being flip floppy. He's telling the cops, I know something, but uh, I'm only going to say it when my mom dies because I don't want to embarrass my mom. So you got any more information on him? Like, kind of, because he, he's already like serving life for uh, what he did. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of Ted Bundy. That's the one thing that these psychopaths, these cruel psychopaths like that, 
I think I think like once again because the, their simulation like I think that's the thing they don't foresee is that if they when they go to jail, all of a sudden they even especially if they're kept under like special custody where they're not in general population because they're infamous, whatever reason, they suddenly lose a lot of that power and a lot of the ability to to get simulated the way they want. So then at some point they realize they need to play mind games, and that this is how they're getting. I mean, you see it so many times with so many of these guys. This is how they get their stimulation. So unfortunately, I mean, even Ted Bundy was lying up until like, you know, two minutes before, you know, he got executed. Yeah. You know, he kept going back and forth and stringing people around. And that's that's unfortunately, that's all that they can do. They, they, they don't have power anymore. So that's the way they lash out and torture people is essentially using social social weapons so right. unfortunately because of that you can't you can't trust them mm. all right the last thing i think we can't close off the show without mentioning the last thing and this is uh, there was a tip uh, there was a crazy tip from a psychic or like someone who had a vision or something like that because this is like the official statement how it went down from the law enforcement that the three women may have been murdered and buried in concrete at a local hospital i have this hospital i will jump to it soon on the google earth uh, for all of the youtube audience and that the three women may have been yeah murdered and buried in concrete at a local hospital but this information has been ruled out because records indicate the hospital parking lot uh, where the information states the woman to be buried began construction after the disappearance of the three women i'm talking about it's going to be a lot of uh, similar names here. It's called the South Cox South Hospital. So, you know, a lot of COXs in here. And now I think it, it's definitely referring to this particular uh, parking lot right here in the hospital. Uh, right here, somewhere right here. And there's a whole video on YouTube you can find of a dude. I'm, I'm, I was thinking of playing it, but I'm, I'm probably not going to be playing it because I feel like we could just like hash it out a lot better. Um, there's uh, a video of a dude doing ground penetrating radar scans uh, because he was hired by a private investigator of some sorts. And now these are the stills from that uh, video that you can see on YouTube where the guy is saying we have three anomalities in this parking lot that would correlate with what you would find after running ground penetrating scans in a graveyard. So it's like he sees something in this parking lot that he would see in... Uh, a graveyard and there's a whole big petition you know, dig up the dig up the parking lot dig up the parking lot police is saying we can't do it because the tip came from a psychic it's not legitimate uh, a lot of people are like literally willing to pay their own money to dig this up which you know i would kind of chip in as well so yeah dude your thoughts on on this whole situation or like do you are can you like read anything from these stills because i can't really read anything from these like there's supposed to be like three abnormalities here no i i yeah it's also one of those things i think the person has to be trained in to really interpret it but it was interesting what he said so this so there was you know like you said there was this reporter i think her name is laura baird um and she got this tip and then she hired this guy to do the ground penetrating radar. And it's interesting because the guy, what he says, oh, sorry, Kathy Baird, Kathy Baird. And, and she, she ends up being a little controversial herself. But this is in 2007. She gets a tip from a psychic. They go to this, you know, this place, which you can't, you have to wonder if the person just picked out the name Cox. But whatever reason, the guy runs the radar per your video you mentioned and he says that well what i'm seeing underneath are things that are starting to kind of deteriorate and you know what i mean it's not just like steel and concrete it's like things that look like different than the steel and concrete that this parking structure is made out of on this part here under the ground under the layer of concrete and he's saying well you know if there were trees nearby those could be roots right because roots kind of change and, you know, can be cut off or deteriorate or grow bigger or, or be a different consistency 
and the steel and concrete, but there's no trees nearby. There's no trees supposedly nearby that site that could have roots. So he's saying, well, you know, it is interesting that you're looking for three bodies, presumably, and you've got this tip and you've got these three things. Now, the only thing that's a little bit problematic or a lot bit problematic is that, well, A, like you said, there's the police don't want to dig it up because they say it's not just expensive. It's like even like has to do with the structural integrity of the building. So you might, you, the, the parking structure, you might have to like maybe do something kind of dangerous or at least knock down the structure. Like it could be really a lot more expensive than people realize. And then what about the, the businesses using the structure, right? They would have to support that too. But I think the other thing that's a little problematic is that now um, the same reporter says that like, well, she says that she's sitting on data on, on stuff that she kind of clammed up suddenly and said she knows more than she's ta- she can say, but she refused to disclose the rest of it because supposedly she's had threats in her life. So there's like a little bit of drama around this Kathy Baird lady as well. I think and, it's my, if, if, yeah. you, if, you, if you go and watch the video, she kind of... It seems like a little bit aggro, you know what I mean? Like a little bit like uh, aggressive in the way she asks questions. I think she's not the type of woman who would be like scared if you're like scared to your life. I mean, okay, so like who's out to kill me? Like, let, let's go, let's do this. Uh, and like, yeah. it's, uh, I feel like she would be like the one that, yo, come at me, you know what I mean? Like, this is America. Yeah. You could get like guns at Walmart. It's like, it's all good, but it's, I feel like, uh, the thing is with with this ground penetrating stuff, I will say I found it super crazy, like super crazy how a psychic because because apparently there's none because these uh, like uh, abnormalities are not anywhere in the vicinity, only in that particular area and apparently that particular area is exactly where the psychic told uh, this Kathy woman you know that there's like someone there. Yeah, I mean it's. It's odd. I mean, I, I mean, I'll admit, I, I'm curious too. Like, I, if it were up to me, I would want them to dig it up. And yeah, I don't know. It's just too bad they don't have, like, just at least one piece of evidence. Somebody besides a psychic, because unfortunately, psychics have a pretty bad track record with these kind of things. Um, yeah. You know, to point at it and say, well this is this is what it is now i think once in a while supposedly there have been maybe that's a good episode by the way in the future if anybody can point to us point us to a case where a psychic broke the case definitively um that would be i think an interesting episode unto itself yeah no doubt um all right so uh I guess theories are out of the way um i guess conclusion time so for me personally i will say I'm not super strong on 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 um, uh, Cox, the individual. I kind of already forgot his full name. I'm just gonna Robert Craig Cox. I'm not super uh, convinced he's the guy because, like, as I've said, like I would uh, assign him like a good thirty percent or like a good twenty percent. Uh, but I kind of feel like he's just being a little bit of a, an attention seeker, uh, doing a life uh, sentence in, in jail. Um, the other suspects, I don't buy them. Uh, well, maybe one of those guys who is just a crazy rapist and has just has no connection to the case. Maybe one of them, the kids, uh, the kids with the satanic stuff kind of doubt it kind of kind of doubt it i think they would do the roi in their heads and they kind of would figure out let's just probably pass up on this one let's let's rob some more graves or whatever and then um lastly how it went down in my opinion uh someone most likely i have no idea how it went down to be honest i just, the, the only thing i know is that a, i feel like there was a gun or a knife to the face and get out the house and this is so crazy because like I have no idea if this person knew of these people or is this like a random abductor who just came in that night abducted and the phone calls the the phone calls how are those phone calls connected how does that even make sense the prank phone calls how is this all happening uh, I have no idea man this case is insane I think part two in the future 
could be a really good thing here if uh, the the fans are interested. So yeah, my conclusions are I I cannot conclude because I have no idea. This is crazy. Uh, so yeah, that's all I have. I'll I'll try to keep it real quick as we, we close it up. So I I have I have, I have two two main suspects. So um, you know one is our friend Cox. I give about an eighty percent chance he did it because I just think he has the skills, the motive. Um, it's not about money. Uh, I think that he probably showed up in a van, um, pretended to be a utility worker, rang the doorbell maybe even, like after he saw them arrive, asked one of them to move the car so he could move his van for quote-unquote tools. So maybe that's why the car was moved to a different place. He gets inside and they don't think anything's going on because, you know, like anybody hears gas leak, they freak out. They're like, oh, thank goodness this person's here to come fix it. Um, so I don't have to deal with it because gas leak will blow up your house. So, and then he gets inside and then he whips out the gun and he's like, all right, here's how it's going to be. And they go along quietly. And then, yeah, at some point he executes them and disposes of their bodies. And the, it's if I say 70 to 80% him, then the 20 to 30% chance is the ex-boyfriend and biker gang. And in that scenario, um, maybe they break into the house from the behind. Somehow they get inside without making a big fuss, but maybe that's how a little bit of the damage happens. I'm not sure. But in their case, they have the logistics to A, move a car, while the other two people kind of watch um, and keep the other, all the women under guard and with a weapon on them. And then the logistics are a little bit easier um, to control the group of them. I just don't know, like you said, if they would have the guts to do it. And even, I don't, I don't mean that in a good way. I mean, like whether they would be so bold as to do something horrible like that um, and be able to keep their mouth shut about it. And um, yeah, whether the motive would even fit like the reasoning, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of empty, a lot of questions here, but that's kind of, and then once again, they, they do it because the motive for them isn't financial and maybe that's why it isn't them because they didn't take the money. Um, and clearly they're hard off for money, uh, and do stupid yeah, things for it. So they would have, yeah. I feel like the 900, they would have taken uh, real quick. So you are not assigning any percentages to an unknown uh, assailant. No, I just, I think it's too, I, I just, I, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't make as much sense to me. I'm not saying it's impossible. It just doesn't for, for whatever reason, I don't see some random person being as crisp and clean as you know, I hold mm. army rangers yeah. in, in, in high esteem, even when they're horrible serial killers. All right. Yeah. It, it actually Allegedly. Make... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it, 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 uh, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense that actually, yeah, I'm kind of thinking back that, yeah, this is kind of it looks like it's it's personal in the sense that at least there was prior knowledge to who lives in the house and who am I abducting. So, yeah, that's. This is a good way to close it off. Um, yeah, uh, I guess, guys, this was episode 101, you know, uh, the first one, I guess, uh, in, in the next 100 of episodes. So that's kind of cool. And we'll catch you on the next week's show. I really enjoy talking about this case this week. And as always, uh, leave your thoughts in the comments. Subscribe if you think this was some good content you want to watch again next week. And then we'll see you next week. Until then... Stay safe and peace out.